And I'd like to introduce Jim Whitehead. He's a professor at UC Santa Cruz and his student, Soon Kim. Um, they've been doing some really interesting work on looking at software evolution and data from source code repositories. So I asked Jim to, to come give this talk, or he kind of volunteered when he found out I'd come to Google. So thanks a lot, Jim. Look forward. Great. Yeah, thanks, John. Yeah, John, you know, I guess when he started working here, he's like, oh, you know, and if any of you are ever in the area, and I'm like, well, I'm in Santa Cruz. I'm always in the area, you know, so I said, come on down. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about some recent work we've been doing in our uh, lab uh, at UC Santa Cruz on predicting bugs. And uh, the uh, work is done with my student, Sung Kim. Uh, there's also another professor, Yi Zhang, at uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, and then my student, Jennifer Bevan as well, and then Thomas Zimmerman and Andreas Zeller uh, are at Saarland University in Germany, and uh, they've collaborated with us on that as well. Um, so the, kind of the idea here is that if we can, you know, if we know where the bugs are, um, you know, before they occur, that you can, can take some steps to improve the quality of your code. So uh, if you know that a particular set of files uh, is much more likely to have bugs than some other set of files, you can spend more of your QA time on those particular sets of files. So you can do things like uh, do more software inspections on those files, or perhaps you can uh, run static analysis tools on those files. Uh, static analysis tools often return a large number of false positives, and so uh, they, you know, generally you don't want to run them across your entire code, but if you know that there's a high likelihood that you're going to find bugs in some section of your code, it might be worth your while to spend that additional time. So in general, there's this you know, kind of realm of techniques that are you know, very time expensive uh, that you can use to improve the quality of your code, um, but you generally don't want to use them because you have fixed QA resources and, and you don't really have a good sense of how to prioritize the application of those QA resources across your code. But if you did have really high quality data that said, you know, I know where the, code, where the bugs are in our code, uh, then you could start uh, doing some of these more expensive techniques. Okay, um, so um, the other you know, uh, kind of work that we do is that we want to uh, improve developer awareness that they, maybe they just created a bug. And so most of the time a developer injects an error into their software and then it may be you know, weeks, months, you know, sometime later that that uh, uh, error actually manifests itself in some externally visible behavior and then after that point in time you're able to go and make a, a, a fix to that. And so there isn't a very strong immediate feedback loop back to the developer that there may be a bug. Uh, if you could actually provide immediate feedback to the developer that there's a high likelihood uh, that they've just created a bug, uh, then the developer right then when they have all that context in their head could maybe go and uh, you know, re-review their code, maybe they could get a colleague to do an inspection and so on so that uh, so you could close that loop a lot faster. Oops. <clears throat> so uh, we have uh, two main results we're going to talk about in this uh, presentation here. Uh, and so one is this bug cache, and then the other one is on predicting buggy changes. And so with the bug cache, what we do is we uh, you know, take the software and we, we put it into two bins. Uh, and so typically we make uh, the one bin, the, the bin of buggy software, we set that to 10% of the total size of the code. And we run our algorithm, and at the end of running our algorithm over the uh, in revision history of the software, uh, that cache, that 10%, uh, will contain you know, 73 to 95% of future uh, bugs in the software. So, so using this bug cache algorithm, uh, we're able to, uh, with very, uh, very good results, uh, tell you where the bugs are likely to occur in your software in the future. And what's nice is, now that you have that 10%, you can focus your effort on that 10%. The other um, work that we do is we uh, have been using machine learning techniques uh, to analyze the uh, the changes the individual commits, uh, and so we're able to uh, we train uh, on the entire revision history. After we have uh, have our trained machine learning uh, uh, algorithms, you know we can, given an individual file level change, so that's about you know tw on average 20 lines uh, that have changed in an individual file. With about 75 percent accuracy, we can tell you whether that's uh, going to have a bug in the future or not. Okay. Things don't match. How do you define a bug? Uh, if two things don't, uh, so which which things? So if if, if you have um, if there's a miscommunication bug between two parts of a system, how, where is it? Uh, right. Yeah. So we um, you know 
So what we are going by in terms of uh, bugs are, uh, you know, we mine the histories, and so typically we're looking for, uh, in the uh, change log uh, of a commit to an SEM system, uh, there's two approaches. You know, if there's a high quality uh, change log, we look for uh, the actual identifier of the bug report and the bug tracking system. And so the developer will say, you know, just committed a fix to bug number whatever, right? Uh, and so then we know that that uh, particular commit contains a bug fix. Uh, oftentimes the uh, commit logs are not that high quality, and so we will then just look for uh, keywords like fix, uh, repair, et cetera. And so there's a small number of keywords that usually indicate uh, that there is a, a bug fix there. Uh, and so we've done you know, some work in the past where we've also gone back and manually examined these things to see, okay, are we, you know, is this getting things that really are bugs or really aren't bugs? And, and it's, you know, the techniques work pretty well, and they're not perfect, but um, you know, barring actually going through you know, several thousand revisions of a software project and manually you know, inspecting each one to say whether that's a bug or not, uh, this technique is automatable and gets us very good results for identifying what's a bug and what's not a bug. Okay, so um, so in some respects, uh, so you know, t uh, what we're trying to do is take advantage of the fact that uh, use of software configuration management systems these days is ubiquitous. All projects uh, of any consequence use SCM systems. Uh, so you build up this um, history of changes, uh, and the idea is that we can can learn uh, from those changes. And especially uh, as people are fixing bugs, they note in their change logs that they have made these fixes. And so this uh, gives us a labeled data set, and the data set is a, a number of changes, and they're labeled with respect to whether they are a bug or not a bug. And so uh, from a machine learning standpoint, you know, we have the holy grail. We have a large data set that's labeled already for us. And so this uh, gives us the ability to, to learn from this data set quite easily. Um, so there's a couple, uh, you know, a couple insights. So the, the bottom one here, software can be classified, and this is classified in the machine learning sense. Uh, so you can do machine learning classification algorithms, and you're essentially classifying a change with respect to either it's a bug or it's not a bug. So you're classifying it into one of those two bins. Uh, and so that's one of the key insights is that you can actually view bug prediction as a machine learning classification problem. And then you can bring all that machine learning machinery uh, to the table now. Um, the other insight here is that uh, bugs exhibit some locality, that they're not just uniformly distributed over uh, over the code and over time, that there are uh, you know, certain files that are much, much more likely to have bugs, and then there are certain periods of time you know, that, that bugs are, are likely to be clumped together in time and not evenly distributed over time. And so you can take advantage of these localities uh, to improve your bug prediction accuracy. Okay, uh, so for the first part of the talk, I'm going to talk about this bug caching work, uh, and then I'm going to turn over to uh, Sung for the uh, uh, bug prediction work, the bug classification work at the end. Okay, um, so I mentioned this a, a bit in answering your question, but uh, so what we have here is we have this um, uh, timeline uh, of changes, uh, and so this is the, the, uh, the evolution of a particular file over time. Uh, these tick marks uh, represent commits of particular, uh, commits of particular points in time uh, to that software. And so what, um, you know, what you have is, you know, initially there's some software change that, you know, where the developer makes a change and injects a bug. Uh, at some later point in time, you have the, the observation of this as uh, some problem that needs to be fixed. So the, the, uh, you have an entry in your bug tracking system. And then at a later point after that, uh, you actually have the, the fix that was made and it was injected. And so um, where we start is we uh, typically start by looking at these log messages. Sometimes we start here, but we're most typically starting with these SEM commit messages. And then we have to, to work backwards to find, uh, find the actual fixes. Um, and so uh, it turns out there's a, uh, you know, an algorithm that uh, some of our collaborators developed, uh, uh, Thomas Zimmerman and Andreas Eller, uh, which uh, gives you the ability to, using the SCM annotate feature, uh, to work backwards to identify, um, you, know, for, you know, which uh, particular revision actually had the uh, initial error in it. Um, turns out that the, you know, there are some some issues with that approach, uh, and so we've done some recent work where we've improved the the algorithm that we used here. Um, but you know, in general, with you know, pretty high accuracy, we're able to work back to what the original uh, error-producing change was. And so what's nice is that, mo you know, most of the work on bug prediction, you know, kind of does under the lamppost kind of work. You know, it's easy, very easy to get this bug fix uh, data. 
Um, but it's, you know, until recently, it's been very, very challenging to reliably get back to the bug inducing, to the, the error injecting change here. And so one of the uh, kind of things that we've been able to take advantage of is this recent advance that allows us to get back to that. Sure. I don't understand why that's complicated to, to work your way back. Um, uh, I mean, the, the source code management system is going to say, tell you line for line, this line was last modified by so and so. Right. So well, uh, yeah. So there's a, a number, you know, number of problems. So uh, one of the problems is that, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, many lines could have been changed here, including uh, changes that involve um, uh, just cosmetic changes or formatting changes, and so that can throw you off. So if you're like well, okay, you know, if the majority of the lines that were changed were in revision four, but the majority of the lines were just formatting changes, then, then that's going to throw you off. Um, the other thing that throws you off is that um, the, the, you know, there is no uh, good way to map a specific line uh, back in time. Uh, so the SEM annotate, you know, does its best, um, but, but it can get confused. Um, and in particular, you know, you can, can get thrown off by the fact that, um, you know, uh, you know, one challenge is to try and go from a particular line uh, to uh, the, the function or method that contains it. Uh, the SEM annotate can't tell you, for example, that you know, the, the function may have changed its name uh, between when the bug was introduced and when it came later. Um, oh, so did I do a good job of answering that? Or I don't know. Right, so we, um, I guess what I can say is that you know, I can go, go into that question a little bit more in depth with you after the fact. Um, we've, so I've just have written a paper paper on that, kind of going into a number of the issues. Uh, you know, I, I guess sort of the you know, uh, you know, in some respects, once you see the algorithm that we use to get back here, it's like, well, it's you know, relatively straightforward to do that. Um, but people haven't been doing that, and, and there are a number of little little gotchas along the way. Sure. What happened to the bug in the same Right. Yeah. So that would throw us off as well, and, and we don't have a good a good answer to that. So so there's some uh, you know there's some class of changes where there might be an environmental change, uh, and so the environmental change is what led to to this change here, um, and so so yeah we will then you know kind of go back and say well okay you know the the initial change you know that kind of led to that bug you know we're just going to track it back in that individual file. Um, you know we still feel that that's useful, and we feel it's useful because. Uh, even in that situation, if there are many other files uh, that you know would would have needed to be changed due to the same kind of environmental change, or if that kind of environmental change is occurring frequently, we're still going to pick that up. And so we may be you know saying that the the you know the fix inducing change you know we may get that wrong, uh, but in some respects our bug classifi classification algorithm is still going to give good results. Sir, sure. uh, so a sufficiently large system to get files for people. Understanding a whole thing and then fixing bugs and the parts that they know. So, well, yeah, you know, right. Where, where, where yeah. they occur. Uh, oh, right. Repeat the word. Okay, so uh, in a large system, you may have, uh, you know, a, a an effect where people are fixing only the code that they know and not fixing other parts of the code. Well, fixing bugs where a bug can be not in the source, but patching around it in the code that they know best. Uh, we, right, or, or they'll be, you know, kind of patching around and, and sort of avoiding some area of the code that they don't like. So there's, um, in some respects, we're not, re you know, so we haven't really seen a strong effect like that in, in the projects that we've looked at, and we certainly know that there are these, you know, areas of the code that are kind of, you know, magic areas of the code or, you know, don't touch areas of the code that, you know, are kind of magical and, and you know, people get into trouble if they, they change them. Um, you know, and so our algorithm would get would get thrown off in that you know we we wouldn't see any changes in those magic sections, uh, and we wouldn't flag them as being particularly buggy. Uh, and so yeah, we we would get thrown off in that case. Um, yeah, I want to want to move on. Okay, so we uh, go through this revision history, and what we're looking for are. Uh, certain kinds of bug localities. Um, so we, we have four main kinds of, of uh, bug locality. So temporal, and so the idea here is, um, uh, oh, so first of all, let me use some terminology here. So we use this term entity. We had this uh, problem in that we want to have a term that talks about either a function or a method. Uh, so we use the term entity here to mean, you know, function slash method. Uh, so, you know, if a function slash method introduced a bug recently, it'll introduce another bug soon. So the sense that, you know, uh, you know, if there's a problem in a, in a particular module, probably you're not going to fix all those problems right away. That is going to continue to be to be problematic. Um, 
this notion of changing, you know, if, it's, if you've changed it recently, um, you know, we're finding across all projects that, you know, uh, almost invariably some, some percentage of all changes are, go are going to be buggy. We've seen this as high as 78 of all, percent of all changes in Bugzilla seem to be buggy. So, you know, almost every time they touch the code, they're adding another bug. Most projects, it's around 10 to 20 percent. Um, so, uh, so if you just, if you make a change at all, that immediately makes it suspect. Um, if you've added a new entity, uh, we find that suspicious. Uh, and then if you've uh, introduced a bug nearby in the sense that it was you know, in the same SCM commit uh, or in the sense that was uh, logically coupled, um, that it'll also tend to introduce new bugs soon. And so the idea here is that uh, you know, if a developer has some mismatch in their mental model and they're making a change, uh, then that change will uh, you know, that problem in their mental model will cause them to introduce uh, errors in a number of different places, not just one. Uh, so what we found is that this temporal and spatial locality contribute the most to bug, uh, bug prediction. Okay, so the bug hash, uh, oh, sorry, question. What about developers? Like some developers are more likely to make mistakes than others. <laughs> Uh, right. Uh, so we, we didn't use uh, developer locality in, in this uh, particular one. Uh, developer actually does end up be, being one of the factors in uh, the bug classification work. And what we find is, uh, you know, for some projects it's a good predictor. Most of the time it's actually not the strongest predictor. Um, and I think the, the, the reason for that is uh, in the classification work is that, you know, a given developer is both committing a lot of good changes and, and, and buggy changes. And so the fact that the developer touched a particular piece of code doesn't mean that that's a, a particularly a good predictor as to whether that's going to be bad code or good code. It's, it's essentially even. You know, it, the fact that the developer touched the code means, well, it might be good and it might be bad. Um, and so, but that may be a, just a quality of those machine learning algorithms that it, you know, it doesn't try to make a model of you know, uh, developer bugginess in some sense. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so we use the bug localities to um, take our software, so we you know, go through all of the um, uh, uh, software and we can uh, use this at either the file level uh, or the entity level. Uh, so typically we set this at about uh, either 10% of files or 10% of functions. Um, the bug cache uh, operates where we have an initialization step, so we essentially take our cache, we preload it with a certain number of, uh, of entities or files or entities. Um, we perform an analysis where we work through the revision history, uh, you know, adding some things into the cache, taking some things out. At the end of the day, we have our bug cache filled with the, the functions of the files that we predict to be the most fault prone going into the future. Um, and so, uh, and, and, you know, again, this uh, shows that you can do it at uh, multiple levels of granularity. At the file level, we tend to do best, but it also works at the function or method level. Uh, and there's a trade off between kind of the smaller you make your granularity, you know, the harder it is to do that prediction. But on the other hand, uh, you don't have to look at it at as much code to figure out where the bugs are. <clears throat> okay, so in the initialization step, we start off by um, extracting the bug fixes. So we go through the revision history and we get back to those. Uh, we get the bug fixes. Uh, we then extract these fix-inducing changes by working backwards. Um, and then we do this preload step in the bug cache. And Right now, we just do a, a simple, you know, the uh, files or entities with the largest number of lines of code. Uh, we say, well, if it has a lot of lines of code in it, uh, then it's immediately suspicious. Um, and it's uh, surprisingly effective. So even after, you know, running through our entire analysis for the Apache 1.3 project, one of the ones we looked at, uh, it's still, you know, uh, you know, that lines of code ended up predicting 18% of the ones that ended up in the cache at the end of the day. Okay. Uh, during the analysis stage, we, we process all the revisions of the project, uh, and so we compute hits, uh, hits and misses here. So, um, you know, we observe where the, the fix-inducing changes are at a given revision. Uh, if a bug occurs in a file or entity that's currently in the cache, we call that a hit. Otherwise, it's a miss. Uh, and so, in some respects, a, a, a cache hit uh, can be viewed as a successful prediction of the bug. So we had it in our cache, a bug occurred. Uh, and so we call that a successful prediction. For a miss, uh, this is where we change the state of our cache, so we then uh, fetch the file, um, and this is our temporal locality, and then we grab all the nearby entities uh, and put those into the cache as well. Um, and then uh, we also do kind of a prefetch, uh, and so uh, you know, we also add in any new entities uh, that have been created or modified uh, at that time. 
Uh, and then, of course, since our, our cache is fixed size, we need to have a removal strategy. Uh, and we've actually explored a couple different removal strategies for taking things out of the cache. Okay, so here's what our results look like. Uh, so we've analyzed a number of uh, substantial open source projects uh, across uh, several different languages. Uh, and so uh, the projects are Apache 1.3, uh, Subversion, PostgreSQL, Mozilla, JEdit, Columba, and Eclipse. Uh, and what we find here uh, is that you know, our best results are with uh, the Mozilla project uh, and with the Eclipse project, and they actually get up into the 90s. It's not at all uncommon for us to be in the 80s, and then Subversion is our worst one uh, in the low 70s. Um, so uh, what you can see is that, um, you know, at least across the set of open source projects, we end up uh, being able to, at the file level, uh, tell you where, you know, which are the most buggy uh, files. Uh, and so this um, kind of sorting it into you know, the most bug prone and the, the not as likely to be bug prone, uh, this works uh, surprisingly well. Um, well, in some respects, the, the, the you know, uh, so software complexity is, uh, has traditionally been very hard to measure. Turns out lines of code is about the best, uh, you know, complexity measure out there. And so in some respects, our prefetch is already loading the, the most complex uh, files or most complex entities in. And it does pretty well. And, you know, for Apache 1.3, you know, it's about, you know, 18% uh, at the end. Uh, you know, that, that most complex, uh, you, know, you know, the most complex ones ended up being the most buggy. Um, the other thing I'll, you know, I'll stress about this is that um, you know, this, this algorithm can be run in a uh, kind of in, a, in an adaptive sense or in an online sense. And so you know, as your project is continuing to evolve, you, know, you can do your initial analysis, you can you know, get your, your sorting, and then you can rerun this uh, weekly or you can rerun it monthly. Uh, and you, know, you can be getting this updated list of what is uh, predicted to be the most uh, bug prone uh, files uh, at that time that you run your analysis. And so it, it will change and it will adapt to changing conditions over time. Okay, uh, so these are results at the file level. Um, so uh, when we do uh, look at the same projects but at the function or method level, um, you, know, uh, you know, as we stated, the, uh, so first of all, this one ends at uh, .8, not at 1. Uh, and so it, it's, uh, you know, the, low, the results are lower. Uh, so the worst is Mozilla here, which is uh, just under 50%. Um, but we can, you know, get up into the high 60s and, uh, you know, hovering around uh, 60 is not, you know, not uncommon. Um, and so, uh, so again, there's this trade-off between, well, can we, you know, the, the finer we get our predictive granularity, the, the harder it is to do because there's, you know, it's a, a smaller, smaller uh, target we're aiming for. Highest one here, and it was the lowest one on the last chart. Or right. I don't know, Song. Do you have any insight on that one? Or I don't know. We, sometimes the, the stuff we get back is just weird. Uh, the, the the weirdest stuff I think are the, the predictors or the uh, features and the the bug classification stuff coming up next. Um, but yeah, we don't have a, I don't have a good explanation for this one. Uh, question. Um, so in this work, I don't think we took that into account, no. Um, so we have done some work uh, in the past on doing uh, automated tracking of uh, file uh, function, uh, function names across renames. Uh, so we call this the, the origin, origin mapping or entity mapping problem. Uh, and it turns out with pretty high um, accuracy, you can actually figure out uh, how these things change across uh, across uh, revisions, um, but it's a pretty time, you know, time-consuming process, and so we didn't, didn't run it on this one. But it, it could potentially be done, and and Sung has a suspicion that if we if we did run this, that that would improve this a great deal. That you know, there's some sense that you know, you know, we kind of lose a lot of history and we lose a lot of information when a function re, uh, gets renamed, and so if we could kind of hold on to that, that that might improve our results a bit. Um, so we tried a couple different cache replacement strategies, uh, least recently used, so the, the least recently found bug we unload. Um, we uh, change count weighted, so uh, we unload the file or entity with the least number of total changes. Uh, bug count weighted, so the, uh, you know, the file or entity with the fewest number of total bugs we, we uh, take out. Um, and so then the, you know, the question is, you know, well, which one of these works best? Uh, and the answer is, well, it kind of depends. Um, so, uh, so here we uh, have uh, bars for um, 
the least recently used uh, for the bug and for the change. Uh, and, uh, and we have that at the file level and then also at the function or method level. And, uh, and what we see is that uh, at the file level, uh, you know, pretty much the LRU is the best. And there's one or two cases where it's not. But, you know, in those cases, it's not that far off. Um, but then down here, um, it's kind of a mixed bag. On the bug, you know, uh, bug-based algorithm seems to be best here. Um, and then LRU doesn't work best there. Uh, so it, it depends on granularity. Uh, and it also seems to depend on the project. Um, so, you know, one of the kind of takeaway lessons we grab from this is that if you're going to do this for real, there would be some process where you would, um, you know, essentially train the, the bug cache for your particular project. And you would learn for your project, well, what are the parameters that give you the best results for your specific project? And you might even want to go through and do a retuning effort, uh, you know, every month or every six months or something like that. Okay, uh, so one question is, well, what can you do with this? So we'd mentioned, you know, doing inspections or uh, static analysis. We can also end up uh, giving developers awareness of this. So, uh, you know, there's a sense that if you're working on some code that's in the bug cache, uh, you know, that bug cache code is, is riskier in some sense. And so maybe you want to tell your developer that you're working on a risky uh, function or method or you're working on a risky file. Uh, so we've done some work where we've done integration into Eclipse. Uh, and, you know, you'll get some, some icons uh, indicating that you're working in, uh, in riskier parts of your code. Sure. Do you have the concept of normalizing it for the number of times the code's been touched? So, therefore, if you've got a piece of code that's being touched all the time by lots of people and it has five bugs, maybe it's less error prone than something that's only touched once and only has one bug. Um, that time was a bug inducing. Yeah, so, no, we, we don't do that. And, and our you know, defense of that practice is, you know, if a particular file is being touched a lot of times and its, its absolute number of bugs is still quite high, that means you're still spending a lot of money to be fixing errors in that file. And you're still spending time there, time is money. And so, you know, you would want to know that that's one of your problematic files. And normalizing that away and saying, oh, well, you know, even though we're spending, you know, 10% of our time on it, you know, you know, relatively is not, you know, not uh, one of the problematic files. And I, my feeling is that's not giving you a, an accurate measurement or an accurate feel. Um. Okay, so at this point I'm going to uh, turn it over to Sung and he's going to talk about the bug classification work. Thanks. So the previous bug cache work, uh, we can identify the file or a function based. We can uh, identify buggy function or buggy files. But if you think about all the development process, most development process is change-based. You change something to add new features, or you change something to fix something like that. So we want to try to identify each change as a buggy or non-buggy. But if you can identify or classify each changes, it's very nice, because one thing is the prediction is pretty much uh, localized. We're looking at only 20 lines average changes about 20 lines of the source code. So we, if we identify a change as buggy, we have to look at only 20 lines of the source code. Also, the prediction is just immediate. Maybe as, as soon as you submit a code to the um, SCM systems, we automatically say your source code contains code, buggy code or not. So it's much easier to remove the potential bugs. So to do that, we use the machine learning algorithms. And we basically use two algorithms, naive basis and um, spot vector machine, which is implemented in Weka toolkit. And then we analyze the 13 open source projects. Uh, basic idea of the machine learning is we can take a bunch of features with a labeled set, and then it can train a classifier. And then later, we can feed an unknown set of the features, and then machine learning algorithms can classify the instance as buggy or non-buggy. That's the basic idea of the machine learning. And for the futures, um, if we think about the changes, so we have basically two files, so all the files and new files. And then between the files, we can compute the deltas, what has been changed in these two files. Also, the file names and directory name can be one of the futures. And we also compute the complexity metrics of C and Java source code, 
and then we compare the complex metrics of the new file and all the file, and then used all the complex metrics as filters. Also, all keywords you typed in in the SM logs, what you have been, have been changed, we used all words in the SM change logs as filters. Finally, we used some uh, change metadata, such as authors who changed this, or when you commit the source code, that kind of information. We used every possible information between changes as a future. And this is the list of the project we analyzed, including Apache and Eclipse subversion and so on. Um, for example, if you look at the Apache project, it, it's written in C language. We look at the revision from 500 to 1,000. It contains 579 clean changes and 121 buggy changes. And then the future number we use is um, 1,100, almost 1,100 features. If you look at the GCC project, we used almost 2,700 features for the classification. And this is the results from the classification of the all projects. Basically, uh, we have about 70% of the accuracy with uh, above 40 to 50 recall. The next question we want to uh, we want to know about is that we have we have used a bunch of different features from different groups. For example, we get the all keywords in edited delta or deleted delta. So the question is, which feature groups are more most significant for the predicting bugs? So we try to um, combine different features from different group and then try to uh, classify again and then see what kind of future has a very strong predictive power. So this is the results from the modular accuracy by um, future combination. For example, each alphabet indicates the group of the futures. The tilde means uh, we used every future but that future. So for example here, the tilde A means uh, we used every future except the edit delta, and so on. If you look at this graph, mostly um, they are good if you use all the features, and it's really bad if you use only new source code features. The Eclipse, we have very similar um, shape of the results. Here, we look at the, all the average um, accuracy by push combinations, what we can find is um, maybe using all future is not the best. Uh, the best is using all futures, but except the complexity metrics is the best. But of course, this is average, so you know each the, each project may have a different behavior. But also, one thing we noticed in here is the A and D, which means edit the delta and delete the delta, and new source code, which means all futures from source code itself, also have a pretty good um, accuracy rate. That means this classifier can be embedded in the editors. So whenever you edit something, we can monitor what you change in the editor, and then we can also predict if your change contains bugs or not. So uh, based on the previous experiment, you can find out the best um, combinations of each project uh, for the accuracy. So again here, the best predictor combination is pretty much different based on the project. Um, also, we try to look at the uh, individual features a little bit here. I'm not sure you can read uh, each character here, but the idea is we try to identify the top, the most significant individual features to predict the bugs. And then we rank them using um, chi-square algorithms. And then also we look at each, if each feature is contributing bugs or non-bugs. For example here, yeah, plus means the future is contributing to bug. 
minus means the future is not contributing to work, which means clean change. So if you look at the um, complexity metrics measure for Apache, obviously the delta means delta of the complexity metrics. So whenever you change a lot of source code, that means a count of line, you are contributing to bug. Or if you look at the uh, plons um, added delta, I'm not very familiar with uh, um, Python. This is written in Python. Whenever you use the self in the source code, you are more likely to creating a bug. Obviously, this we need more like uh, research to see what is really patterns in here, what kind of patterns we can find out in bug code. But this gives you like overall idea is that there is some patterns that introduce bugs. Yeah. It fixes the bugs 345 in Mozilla patch. It introduces more bugs than anything else. Right. But correcting does not fix it. Okay. And for Apache, you can make any change as long as it doesn't use if. Because if is, is highly likely to produce a bug. For the results here, um, the best features for classifications vary by project and projects. So there is no cross project model here. Um, also, the best uh, algorithm, classification, machine learning algorithm varies by project to project. And what you can find is about we, we can predict about 70% of the accuracy and recall range. But this is, we think this is very promising because what we used is it's very basic stuff. We just extract all keywords from the source code. We didn't perform any semantic analysis or very uh, expensive uh, the static analysis um, for these futures. But still, we get this kind of uh, high accuracy rate. So we think if you can apply more uh, co complicated algorithms or more future engineering techniques, we're going to raise about 5 to 10 percent accuracy rate. We have much more data about this. So if you are interested in, we are more than happy to show it to you. OK. Uh, All right, thanks, Sung. Um, so kind of the, the summary, high-level summary of the talk is that, well, it's now possible to classify files uh, as fault-prone or not fault-prone with very high accuracy. Uh, the results that we got across many different open source projects showed that very consistently we were able to, uh, to do this. Um, and the other uh, result is that it's now possible to classify individual file-level change. You know, on average, 20 lines of code have changed here. Uh, as likely to have a fault or not likely to have a fault. Uh, and this can be done with, uh, you know, not stellar accuracy, but still very good accuracy. Probably enough accuracy that developers might pay attention. So uh, in my view, this raises a number of, of, uh, of open questions. Uh, so one is, uh, you know, we've been doing this in the lab. We've been analyzing open source projects, and we haven't tried to inject these results back into the project itself and see how this knowledge would cause developers to change what they do, how it would cause QA people to change what they do. And I think there's a lot of open questions there. Um, so one is, you know, would doing this, would this affect the accuracy of our predictions? Um, it's conceivable that this might make our predictions get more accurate. It's possible it might make them get less accurate. You know, we're not, we're not sure what, what's going to happen there. Um, we're also very curious with this fault classification work. You know, if you tell a developer, you know, dear Mr. Developer, uh, we are 75% likely that you have just made a change. We regret to tell you, however, that we cannot tell you what, what that error might be or where you should start looking, right? So, so how would developers react to that kind of knowledge? Um, you, know, you know, they know that it's probably right, right? Um, but, you know, where, where do you start, right? Uh, and so in some respects, uh, you know, some of our future work that we're looking at is can you give the developer any hint within those 20 lines where to start looking for likely places that there might be a bug. Um, and, and, you know, would, would developers like this at all? Uh, and as Sung pointed out, it's conceivable that you don't even have to wait for the commit. And, you know, it could be that you're typing along there in your development environment, and then all of a sudden, you know, bing, you know, we're not quite sure exactly what you just did, but we now are pretty sure that you just have a bug, right? And so it could be the thing you just typed, or it could be something that you've done previously. And, um, but it does seem that we can, you know, we can do this. And so how would, how would developers react to that, right? Um, 
do QA organizations really want essentially more bug reports? And you know, would you know, is this information on prioritizing the bugs, uh, you know, into you know, that well, this 10% is is most likely to have the the problems. You know, is that really useful, uh, or does that just end up being you know another piece of interesting but not really actionable information? So what we'd like our analysis to do is produce both interesting and actionable information. So our, our feeling is that you should be able to take proactive action and bring down those bug rates in those files, um, you know, possibly by doing restructuring, possibly by doing code inspections and so on. Um, but it may be the case that, um, you know, that that doesn't work. Um, and then, uh, you know, can we, you know, can we improve these, uh, improve these techniques? Um, the other open question is we've been looking at open source projects. Uh, you know, it's quite possible that some of the characteristics of open source development could skew our results. Uh, and in particular, we know that the pattern of people coming onto projects and leaving projects in industrial settings is generally quite different from those in open source projects. And so it's, it's quite likely that that may, uh, may change the accuracy of our results. Um, uh, but again, it may go up, it may go down as well. Uh, so we'd, we'd very much like to try this out in an industrial setting. And in, in many respects, that's, you know, that's what uh, motivates us to come here, is that you know, we would like to, to find projects and people who are willing to allow us to come in and to run our analyses on these projects um, and you know, give you the results and, and allow us to, to also publish those results as well. Uh, so that concludes our talk, and uh, thank you for coming. So questions? Question. Well, so it sounds like what you said is uh, change has risk. So I guess I don't see how you're, when you're being more precise than, than that general notion, which I think we all, all have already. Right. Okay. So, so the question is, well, also we all know that change has risk. Um, you know, what are you, what are you doing, kind of above and beyond this? Um, well, so what I think this work does beyond just the the change has risk is that it can tell you, um, you know, specifically those you know those areas in which change is occurring, which are much more likely to have, uh, you know, risk that manifests itself into bugs. Um, so, you know, so it is entirely possible to have. Um, you know, files that are, especially with the bug classification work, it's possible to have files that are changing and that we don't predict them as having, having bugs. Um, and so it's, you know, it's certainly not the case, at least for that, that change will necessarily cause it to be uh, you know, noted as having, having more bugs. Um, now for the bug cache, yeah, and the fact that a file is uh, changing a lot is uh, very likely to, to cause it to end up in the cache. Um, but um, the uh, you know certainly for the the bug classification work you know it's not a one to one you know change means we we say it's buggy. Um, question. So as a sort of follow up to that, how often do you find people that change prediction work had large changes? Right. Yeah. So, Sung, now you've done a little bit of looking into uh, kind of pers you know frequency of large changes in in the files, right? So, in the um, I don't know, do you want to address that question or I, so, so uh, um, and so we've we've looked at uh, done some look at um, you know kind of how often these large changes occur. Um, you know, they don't occur super frequently, uh, but they do occur. You're right. Yeah. Um, we actually manually inspect all the changes in the open source case. Mostly um, there are changes like 20, 39 um, range. But the big change, as you mentioned, the 100 line or 200,000 lines are mostly either permitting change or you change some APIs and that affects all the things. And then we found out, actually we, um, in this research we didn't exclude that kind of changes, but in, in the current research we exclude so that kind of change, we think that's kind of false positives. Okay, so the question was, you know, it would be nice if you could for, you know, kind of medium sized changes, um, you know, be able to say whether there's a bug there uh, or not. And so, 
you, I, you know, I believe we're, I, my sense is we're doing that, right? I, and so there's, you know, so we say that our average, you know, change is 20 lines, but um, the, the changes that we're feeding into the, the bug classifier, you know, they have a, quite a range uh, there. And we haven't done a specific analysis to say, well, what is the accuracy at, at certain change uh, sizes? Um, you know, I, um, I don't know, I, I guess this, you know, this work has produced enough surprises that I'm not going to go out on a limb and say, predict what that would be like, but, uh, you know, my sense is that that would be pretty uniform, you know, once you got above, say, 10, 15 lines in your change, you know, because you would have a fair amount of data in there, and so these classifiers tend to work pretty well if they, if they have something to work with. And so I, I would imagine that maybe the accuracy might fall off if you get to very low numbers of changes. But, but even there, you know, with things like if often being a, you know, a high predictor, uh, you know, they, they still might do a good job. Uh, how does this behave on uh, changes which uh, just introduce new code? Uh, does it, uh, how accurate is it on those? Uh, does it flag all sufficiently large new code changes as having bugs? Right. I don't know. I think maybe you should come up. I feel like I'm handing off half of these to you. So, um, so the question was, so how, how well does the, the um, uh, does the bug, bug classification, uh, or yeah, how well does the bug classification work handle uh, additions of new code? So it's pretty much depends on the what kind of code you are creating. If the new code is something we've, we have been seen in the previous uh, change histories, and then we identify that very similar code as, uh, for example, buggy, then your new code, new code will be classified as buggy code as well. But it's based on the previous histories. Is that answers your questions? I was curious, on the market charts, uh, you suggested that cyclic technical complexity was not a good valuable component for some analyses. But on the, on the table, where you're looking at ifs and raises and high there's a placeholder for cyclic complexity. So, um, right. Yeah. So, uh, so here's the the table. So the question was, um, you know, so uh, so there was a previous chart, and let's see. I think it was um, uh, this one here, which was suggesting that okay, if you look at everything except for if you use everything except for the complexity metrics, that produces the best result uh, for for classification accuracy. Um, but yet, if you come down and you look at uh, this table here, and you start looking at it. You know, you know, for example, especially with Apache, right? And those are, uh, that's, that's showing that at least for Apache, the complexity metrics are pretty good predictors. Uh, and then you are also, the questioner was also pointing out that there are a couple of other um, uh, features in here which are good proxies for some of those complexity metrics and they were also getting, getting raised good. So, uh, so I guess kind of two, two points here. You know, one is that um, what we're finding in doing this kind of evolution analysis is that uh, you know, the kinds of analysis you have to do have to be project specific. And so uh, it's really not possible to, say, train a model on one project and then apply it to another project. Um, the only time we've seen that in the literature to work even kind of well is if you take, say, you know, an earlier version of Apache and train it on that and then try to apply it to a later version of Apache, but that's essentially the same project. Um, and they're just kind of treating them as two different projects. Um, so, in, uh, so that's kind of one answer that, you know, uh, yeah, we would fully expect that some project would work well, some project would not work well. And so what that, that you know, bar chart was showing is that on average across many projects, uh, not including the complexity metrics works well. Um, but that it's, uh, I would say it's not surprising that they work well for some projects. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that um, it's often the case with these features that even if you run your analysis and say, well, it seems like we do a little bit better not including it in, um, that, you know, if you, you know, it, you know, if you are running a separate analysis where, uh, say, you're, you're and I'll let me get back to the chart so I can point here. Um, you know, so, so this may say here that, oh, okay, you might just want to, to throw out the complexity metrics, but then, of course, for those projects where the complexity metrics work well, you know, you would presumably have a lower, lower predictive accuracy. On the other hand, you might, you might not necessarily lose all of that um, in that because the, the uh, machine learning algorithms are essentially kind of weighting all of these features, um, you know, it may just be that even if you remove one whole class of features, it'll just reweight all the existing ones, and it still may get fairly decent predictive accuracy. And so it's, so there's a cut, you know, it uh, feels to me sometimes with this machine, me, these machine learning algorithms, it's, it's almost like magic going on under the hood because they're, you know, it's like they're, they're able to adapt. You take out some piece of information, and it still seems to do well, and you're like, how can you just remove this whole huge piece of information or, or class of information, and it still does well, right? And, 
So anyway, it's, uh, and, and of course the, you know, it just drives me crazy, you know, it's like you'd like there to think that there's some kind of, you know, like rational causal model for, you know, why do bugs get into the code, right? And, and then you look at, at these features here and you're like, well, you know, sometimes if you add if, you know, that's a high predictor, but not always the case. And so it's not just, you can't just, you know, label if as, as the bogeyman all the time. Um, and, you know, sometimes the author uh, is important, but most of the time the author isn't. Um, you know, it, it's just, you know, and so like, you know, here self is bad, um, but, but in other projects, you know, similar kinds of constructs aren't. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's a real head scratcher here. And so it's, um, you know, I guess it's kind of, you know, highlights some of the, the pluses and minuses of, of using machine learning in that it can, can see patterns, uh, you know, there that, uh, you wouldn't, as a human, ever have been able to pick out. Uh, on the other hand, what you get back as kind of your predictive model is just is just weird, right? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't give you this kind of nice, you know, you know, if X happens, then then Y happens kind of causal model. Jim, sure. So the, the, just to follow up on that, the deleted delta on Apache with if, right, is plus 18. So that means taking an if statement out. Right, right. So that's actually reducing the complexity. So you're more likely to introduce a bug in Apache if you reduce the cyclomatic complexity than if you increase the cyclomatic complexity. Well, uh, well I know with Apache, they get you coming and going, right? So you know, if you add an if, that's a really good predictor. But if you remove an if, that's also a pretty good predictor. Uh, lower, yeah, lower number. So, so one one means it's the best possible predictor, um, and then uh, and then a very high number, you know, means it's higher. And so, uh, and then in each in each line, you get the top five uh, predictors, uh, top five predicting features for that uh, class of features. So that's why, for example, on you know complexity metrics for Eclipse, and they're all up in the hundreds. You know, that just happened to be those were the top five best complexity metrics for Eclipse. Um, uh, but they, you know, overall, you know, in the project, they're bad, bad predictors. It's just that they happen to be the best, the best five uh, ones for complexity. How, how do you handle uh, combinations of files? I didn't exactly get that. So you do a check-in and you change three files. Are you taking into account the combination, the specific combination of files that you've changed? Are you able to say something about? Uh, which of those three files is more likely to have the bug in it that you're committing? Right. Let me let me hand this one over to Sung. So the question is, uh, uh, you know, so if you uh, in a commit that has multiple files, and that's a fairly common case, um, you know, does the the bug classification algorithm can it say anything about well, uh, you know, are any of the files more likely to have bugs than others, or uh, does it kind of do some aggregation across all the files and so on? The quick answer is we didn't take an account of the uh, code changes. We look at the uh, individual file changes. But I think that's a good idea to look at. Thanks. Question. Uh, right, so the question is, have we done anything to predict the severity of the bugs? Um, so unfortunately, no, the, the uh, and, and this is uh, in some respects one of the reasons we would like to get into an industrial setting. So the, the bug data that we have to work with uh, is not uh, uniformly labeled with um, severity uh, data. Uh, and so, you know, in some industrial settings, you know, they are, are very good about labeling uh, bugs with uh, particular severities. And so, you know, if we can, it's certainly, if we can get our hands on such a data set, we can certainly do that prediction. Uh, we just don't have that information available. Uh, but yeah, it would be really interesting to, to see, you know, are we predicting all the low priority bugs or are we predicting high priority bugs? Are we predicting them fairly evenly with respect to priority level? Um, yeah, it would be nice to know. Uh, you know, it's like, are we, are we flooding the system with predictions of, of minor stuff or, you know, are we really catching some, some of the good stuff? And, uh, you know, at, at present we don't have a good sense of that. Um, have you looked at anything about how long call bug surfaces? So, of course, the one everybody cares about is the bugs that make the pass release um, and get picked up by the customer. Right. Uh, excellent question. I'm going to turn this one over to Sung. He actually has done some some recent work looking at the the time between uh, the bug inducing change and the the bug fix change. Um, and I know, I'm trying to remember the graph that that he he produced, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, so so the question was. Uh, 
uh, you know, w uh, you know, have we done any work looking at um, kind of the, the uh, time it takes between a bug introducing change uh, and a bug fix change, and, and what does that frequency distribution look like uh, of, of those times? I mean, in open ca source case, when we look at the uh, real bug introducing point and then real bug fix point is average um, 100 days and two, 200 days to fix that kind of data. Also, we think um, the some files that takes a longer time to fix the bugs, maybe it's uh, some indication of a buggy or non-buggy. So the future work, maybe we can take that in account as use one of our futures for these classifications. And I'm trying to remember the shape of that graph. As I recall, it's like if it's, um, uh, it's, it's a normal, yeah, but it's a normal boat just with a pretty, pretty fat, pretty fat middle. Uh, so there's a, okay. Well, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, great, great questions, and thanks for, thanks for coming out. And we, you know, we can answer lots more uh, after the talk, too.